our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as our practice is, as you invite others to join you. Let's take this moment and dedicate this session to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, we welcome your presence, yes, your glory, mm. your peace. Mm. As your word goes out, yes, it goes out by power, mm. by revelation, yes, by love, yes, to redeem, yes, and to change, mm -hmm. to align us yes, back to the heart of God yes, in our generation. Mm -hmm. May you be given the glory, yes, the honor, the power, mm -hmm. and all the worship yes, in Jesus' might. Amen. 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 There is a desire for every man. Nearly everyone I have encountered in life has within them that innate desire for wholeness. To be whole with nothing broken, nothing missing. This is a lifelong yearning that all people of all walks of life possess. It is that cry from deep within that says, I want to be me. I want to live a fulfilled life. I want to get my act together. All that speaks to this fact. And many, very few people realize this. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is a call for humanity to live a wholesome life. You see, the, where is the challenge? Many people pick the wrong way to do it. They think it is up to them. They think it is what they do or what they try to fulfill in life. But the fact is, like what we see in today's gospel, fulfillment proceeds from God. If you let God fulfill you, then you will be fully filled, holy, perfect, proportionate, containing nothing awkward, nothing out of balance, with everything in harmony. Let's look at today's text as it amplifies this message. Last week, we saw the bride of Christ, the wife of the Lamb, come down in glory. And we saw the bride from afar off. Now, we are drawing closer. John now is giving us a view from the closer look of what this bride actually looks like. And as we go into today's text, we will be taking it from Revelation chapter 21 from verse 12 to verse 14. Let's see what the scripture says. And the Bible says of the new Jerusalem, it says also 
She had a great and high wall with 12 gates and the 12 angels at the gates. The names written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east. Three gates on the north. Three gates on the south. And three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And that is our text for today. Here, we are now seeing up and close to the city. John gives us the layout. We saw the long view. Or the bird's view or the overview. Today we are looking at its layout. Next week we will be looking at at its measurements. And the week after, we'll look at its materials. And all that is pointing to the bride, the people of God, sanctified and set apart as God's own possession that we live in the new world that the Lord will have created. After the present world has passed away. Let's look at this. There are several things that come forward. One is the wall with the gates and the angels guarding the gates. Now, I need to point out one thing. To our mind today, when we talk about gates and walls, we look at that in terms of security. What is intended here is to show us the eternal security, which points to the salvation that we have eternally in Christ Jesus. It does not talk about the security against attacks from the enemy. Because at this point in time, all evil has been dealt with. At this point in time, the enemy and every root of Evil has been eradicated from the face of the new world. What exists is the love of God. What exists are the three things that Paul talks about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he says, now abides the three. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these being love. What a wonderful time this will be. Where hope abounds. Where faith abounds. But above all, where love abounds. That is something to look forward to. Back to the city. 
The Bible points out that there are 12 gates and there are 12 angels. Now, there is a lot of debate. Some say possibly it is one angel at every gate. And others are saying, no, it is 12 angels with each gate having 12 angels. It makes no difference. Basically, why are the angels there? Remember we said, when the bride comes down, God will abide. Land Rosote in the midst of his people. And we radiate his glory. So God's people now radiate his glory. And the angels of God that guard the gates are there to attend to the glory of God and to serve and minister to the saints as is declared in Hebrews 1.14. This is a wonderful experience experience. So remember, this is not a nebula, something without dimension just showing up. It, it is not a, a, a floating entity that is out of place. There are specific dimensions. Why the dimensions? Because God's glory is now shown within its limits. It is being limited to the place of God's people. And it is not because God's glory is not radiating all over his creation. But there is a dimension that God is revealing amongst his people that takes all paints the message that this is his prized possession. Not that everything is not his possession. He creates a new heavens and a new earth. So everything that is within it is his creation. It is his possession. But he chooses to manifest a certain level of glory and glamour amongst his people. I want us to look at the walls and the gates. These gates, the Bible says, have names written on them. And these are the names of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Which points to the covenant of God relating with Israel. The promises of God relating to First of all, his people, Israel. But going back to Abraham, <laughs> when he called him and gave him the name Abraham and made the promise to him that through him all nations will be blessed. Now this permeates past the nation of Israel. And Jesus talks about the same. When he met the woman at the well, John chapter 4 verse 22, and say, tells her salvation is from the Jews. So what he's trying to seek to tell us here is God's eternal covenant 
revealed first in the, with the children of Israel. And then he comes to Jeremiah 31 and he makes a new covenant that extends to the uttermost parts of the earth which covers all the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Now let's look at the symmetry of the gates. The Bible says there are three gates pointing to the north, three gates pointing to the south, three gates pointing to the east and three gates and the west. What is all this symbolism about? This arrangement, by the way, is an arrangement that has been in scripture before. We see it in Numbers chapter 2. This is how the children of Israel were arrayed, arrayed their tents in the wilderness. As they were journeying from Egypt to the land of promise. As they were moving from the land of captivity. To the land that God had promised them. The same picture we capture in Ezekiel when he gets the revelation of the millennial Jerusalem where they have the same array of how the tent of how the temple will look like. Now, this we have moved past the millennium. We are now into the new order. And we see the same. So, what are the walls speaking to? The walls are speaking to a separation of intimacy. Let me explain it this way. You have wanted possibly to have a get together at home. So when you have a wall or a perimeter and everybody is inside, the walls shut out all the other people. Basically, it is speaking of an intimate fellowship that is separate from any kind of intrusion. God's desire here is to speak to fellowship with his people with his people without any intrusion from any of the created things. God is declaring a peculiarity about this creation. And it is him among them bringing wholeness, satisfying their every need, radiating his glory through them. It is him satisfying the bride and letting the bride radiate in the glory that can only come from the groom who is the lamb. Also the gates speak of communication, deliberation and administration. It takes us back to why the gates have the names of the children of Israel. This speaks to the 12 tribes and how God used the 12 tribes of Israel or used the Jews 
to communicate to us about who he is, about his plan for humanity, about his love for mankind. So this is God telling us that I have chosen a people out of the multitude. They are my own. Jesus paints it this way. In Luke chapter 13, verse 29, this is what he says. He says, they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So the gates will be the access. Now, I need to point out something. You see, when you see the 12 gates, it does not mean that there are so many accesses to the kingdom. Jesus removes that thought process. John chapter 10 verse 9. He says, whoever enters through me will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. He goes again to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. So Jesus is the way. But once you are in, then you can walk in and out with the liberty that God gives. Now, having understood that, we then go to the next place, which is the foundation. So John has given us the structure we have seen the significance of the wall. We have also seen, secondly, the significance of the gates with the names of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. He then moves us to the foundation of this temple. Of this, to the, he moves us then to the foundation of this city. Remember, I told you that the city is the, our future or our eternal destiny, our eternal selves. This is the picture of God's people coming down from God with God in our presence, radiating his glory. John tried to describe this, the glory that he now sees. And uh, he is he, it is beyond description by the finite mind. So, so he's not describing it any less. He's trying his best, but he's not describing it any different. So I want you to have this picture in mind. Then he speaks of after having looked at the massive walls, he says this city is anchored by 12 foundation stones. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now these stones speak to what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.20. 
Where well, he points out that the apostles are the foundation of the church. So, what the foundation speak to? They speak to stability. They speak to permanence. Every structure is as good as its foundation. If the foundation is destroyed, if the foundation is weakened, then it is only a matter of time the whole structure will come down. So what does what is the symbolism of this foundation? The foundations speak of the New Testament truth and practice. Things that we can only slowly grasp even now with our finite mind. Things which we only get to understand by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Things we only get to experience when we yield ourselves to the action of what the Spirit is prompting us to do. Things which can only be experienced when we are malleable in the hands of God Almighty. It, is, it takes it to another level. And here then, I won't know is where we see the three pillars come to pass. Then we know in part, like Paul says, right now, but then we see it whole. We understand what love is all about. We will understand what it hope is all about. We understand what faith is really all about. And you see, what you will all find ourselves, when we look at the foundation, the, so some people are like, are they in rows? Are they in columns? And you see, that's why we often miss it. But let me explain how the foundations were in the ancient structures that were built. So what they did, they dug down until they came to what they called a bedrock. And when they got to the bedrock, the, the foundation of the stone, it is here that they laid the capstone. This is what Paul took talks about in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 20 to 22 where he talks about us being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone and the whole building being put together by him and grows into a whole sanct holy sanctuary in the Lord. And he says, you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Now listen to what is happening here. Christ is the foundation. The cornerstone. Then you have the foundation and you have Christ as the builder and we are being built in him. I, I want you to see 
where the permanence comes in, where the wholeness comes in. God is not building something that will collapse tomorrow. God is building something that is wholesome. You and I in Christ Jesus are being built together. And I love the word together. That means it is not just you. It's not just me. You and I, everyone in Christ Jesus, are being built together into God's dwelling in the Spirit. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And this is the picture that we see here. We have a cornerstone or a capstone. Now you need to understand this because it will bless your heart. When they went to the foundation, they got this corner. And on this corner, at a right angle, they put this stone. It is here that they began to build. So at right angles, so at a right angle, that means at an angle of 90, on one arm and on the other, they began to construct. So if you removed this cornerstone, the whole structure would then come down. But it cannot come down because Christ is the cornerstone. So it is holding the entire structure. And what happens is amazing because what is being built here all points to him. So you have the prophets who speak concerning his messianship. Then you have the, the apostles who are experiencing who are speaking concerning what they saw, what they experienced. So, you're, which ties into what has been prophesied by the prophets. And everything points to the cornerstone who is Christ Jesus. Therefore, the Bible tells us there is no no other foundation that has been laid save Christ Jesus. So the prophetic points to him. The apostles apostolic points to him. So whatever is being sent has to eliminate, come from him. So whatever is being prophesied has to come back to him. Let me explain to you sense of God. The prophetic does not point to anything else except Christ Jesus. The apostles Apostolic originates from Christ Jesus. So everything comes to him. Points to him and proceeds from him. That is the foundation he is talking about. And now we see the layers of the names of the apostles. The stones being laid. And then Peter winds it up so well. He calls you and I the living stones that are being built into this spiritual house. Uh, you need to understand this. So what is the point? Then you read yet the Father's glory. Because you then are the bride of the Lamb. 
Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to Jesus. So these walls that we talk about are the walls of testimony which meet in the corner and the corner is Christ Jesus. Hope you got that understanding. Let's go briefly to the number 12. It talks about the 12 gate, the world that has 12 gates. It talks about the 12 angels. Then it talks about the 12 tribes of Israel. Then it talks about the 12 foundations. Why 12? Because 12 represents the totality. Now we see the Old Testament. I told you when the children of Israel were moving from Egypt to the land of promise, they had that symmetrical set up in the wilderness as they moved to the new the land of promise. But I want you to see something here. An entire generation perished. And those that inherited only two got into the land of promise. But again, God's promises were yes and amen. They still inherited what God had promised. And out of them a nation was created. So this points to the totality of the Old Testament. When they are referring to the 12 gates. And when they come to the foundation, they are linking now the old and the new. Bringing it together. So this speaks of the full complement of God's people. The 12 tribes which God ministered to through the prophets. And then the apostles who Christ left to send the gospel forward after he had ascended on high all come together as God's people in this spiritual house in this city that John now sees come down it is God saying, these are my favored ones. Both under the old and the new covenant. This is the entire group. Wholesome. This is the entire group. Where do they draw the wholeness from? From God. Where do they draw the wholeness from? From the cornerstone. The foundation is laid. This is a stable structure. Walled in, in fellowship with God. Radiating his glory. Radiating his power. Radiating his majesty. Wholeness, if I may say it again, is not in what you do. Wholeness is achieved from relationship with God. With Christ as the foundation. It begins now. And in the new world, when the city of God comes down, his very own, his prized possession will then shine forth in glory. The question I'm asking, will you be one of those? If the answer is no all, I'm not sure. This is where it begins. 
Surrender your life to Jesus today. Why don't you allow us to pray with you? As you give your life to Jesus. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody has the standard. God is the standard. And God's standard is Christ Jesus. So all of us come short. And the implication of that is death. You see, a lot of people say, but since all of us have sinned, we are all sinners. That's true. We are all sinners. But there are some two things you need to understand. There is what we call the sin nature. Which Christ came to redeem us from. And there is what we call sins. Which are the deeds of the sin nature. You see, once you are redeemed, then the Holy Spirit comes in. And where you sin, then the blood of Jesus washes away your sins. Listen to this. The sin nature is only dealt with at the cross. Where the penalty of sin was paid in full. And it comes by you believing in what God did in Jesus Christ. And that is where wholeness begins. The Bible says you believe in your heart and are justified. You confess with your mouth and are saved. And then the sins is what the blood of Jesus deals with. The blood washes away your sins. That is what the Bible teaches us. Now, don't look at the sins. Let's look at the sin nature. And that's where we begin. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Holiness begins at that point. Let's pray this prayer with me. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, say, Father of glory, Lord, the creator of the universe, today I have heard your word concerning your city concerning its foundation, concerning its walls and its gates. I acknowledge I am a sinner. I need a savior in my life. I need a cornerstone on which to be built up. Jesus, I need you in my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Come in, Lord. Deal with my sin nature. Forgive my sins. Wash them with your blood. Thank you, Lord. Because I believe that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you died and rose to accomplish that. Thank you for saving me. Write my name in the book of life. Amen. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father of glory, for those that have committed their life to you, you say them that come to you, you will know I is cast out. I pray for them. I pray for their destinies. Lord of glory, by your Holy Spirit, may a new journey be opened before them. Holy Spirit, God, protect them. Preserve and keep them. Teach them this truth. Amplify it in their hearts that they may be built up and they may walk in this truth. Lord of glory, I thank you. 
In Jesus' name. Now, for you who is born again, this is wonderful news. You are now being built in Christ Jesus. Dive to get, dive further into this truth. Wholeness like I may state originates from God. It originates from a thriving fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Your life can be made whole. Today, get into the Word of God. Get into prayer. Get into the practice of praising and worshiping God. Get into the time of creating that personal time and moment of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Let quiet time with God not be a duty. No, let it be a delight. And you will see wholeness coming out. Out of your life. Why? Because wholeness is in Jesus Christ. And only in Jesus Christ. Therefore, thank you for watching us. And until we meet again, from the Dominion Church. We're saying God richly bless you. Have a wonderful week. Shalom.